released back by Konami during the NES days, back when they had a very firm grasp of what they were doing with the console, Bucky O'Hare is kind of a strange licensing choice. It was spawned from an underground comic book, which in turn inspired not only a Saturday morning cartoon show, but also a huge line of toys and action figures, and even two different video games, both made by Konami. One of them being an action beat-em-up for the arcades, and the other one being the NES game, which we're taking a look at today. Now for those of you who don't know the story of this franchise, I'm not the least bit surprised. Not many people do remember it. Seriously, whatever popularity Bucky O'Hare had was pretty much a flash in the pan. And while I can remember liking the Saturday morning cartoon show quite a bit when I was a kid, I was totally unaware of anything else regarding the character, and I had completely forgotten about it until years later when I picked up the NES game. I'm just saying, in a world where we've already rebooted Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Thundercats, Rainbow Bright, My Little Pony, G.I. Joe, Transformers, and pretty much every other cartoon based on a toy line ever, I'm really surprised that Bucky O'Hare hasn't come back, at least for nostalgia's sake yet. Anyway, that's getting off topic. Talking about the story of the entire franchise, it concerns a far-off parallel universe called the Anniverse, where everybody is, and I hope you're sitting down for this, anthropomorphic animals. The evil Toad Empire has tried to take over the entire Anniverse with the help of their leader, a sentient computer. And, of course, they've already taken a good chunk out of conquering everything that they can see. So, the only way to stop them is for a small group of rebels, led by the Righteous Indignation, piloted by Captain Bucky O'Hare, to try and stop them and destroy the sentient computer. You've probably heard this plot a billion times already, so there's not really a whole lot to go over here. And once again, it's kind of funny considering that this faded into obscurity when something like Star Fox, which had a very similar plot, is still going pretty strong. Or at least it would be if Nintendo would make a brand new game about it. Come on, Nintendo, stop cock-teasing us! I'm sorry. The basic plot of the NES game follows what would probably be an arc in the comics or an episode of the TV show. The Righteous Indignation has been put under attack by Toad, Patrolmen, and all of Bucky's teammates have been captured. Not only that, but they've also each been imprisoned on separate planets. Bucky, the only one who managed to escape, now needs to go to each of these planets, free his crewmen, and stop the Toad flagship that is now rotating around the entire place. It's a very basic plot, but then again, do we even play these old NES games for the story anyway? Well, maybe with one or two exceptions, but this definitely is not one. The game plays out much like a standard action platform shooter. You run through the level, you try to get to the end, you beat the boss at the end, you rescue your crew member, along the way you pick up items that will help extend your life and your character specific power bar, which I'll get into a little later on. You rinse, you recycle, you repeat until the end credits. It's a very standard NES formula and it's pulled off very, very well here. For starters, the controls are very immaculately designed. Running, jumping, and shooting all feels really easy and very natural, and all the controls are extremely responsive. The one downside, though, is that when you do get hit, you do get knocked back a bit, like Mega Man or Castlevania characters, but it's forgivable. Also, I should note that the invincibility time when you do get hit, combined with the knockback, does make for a few annoying circumstances where you're surrounded by enemies, but again, these situations are very few and far between. Now, this is all very standard NES fare, but one of the things that makes this game a bit more unique is the fact that there are multiple characters to play as. That's right, Bucky O'Hare's team is not just a plot device, but they are actual characters that you can play as whenever you release them from their imprisonment on the planet that they are trapped on. And what's more, Every single character has a unique weapon and a unique character ability. Bucky, being the first character that you get in the game, is fairly standard fare. His blaster pistol is relatively weak, but it can be fired pretty rapidly. He's also the only character that can shoot directly up for some reason. His special character ability is a high jump, which you do by holding down the fire button to charge it up. Kind of like what you do in Super Mario Bros. 2 when you need to do a super jump. 
Blinky, who is found on the green planet, is the smallest member of the crew and can throw little arching grenades. They don't do much damage, in fact I'm pretty sure they're weaker than Bucky's blaster pistols, but they are the only weapon in the entire game that can break through brick walls, meaning that Blinky is really the only character in the game that is essential for non-combat purposes. Deadeye Duck, being a four-armed duck, has the special ability of climbing along walls and ceilings. You would think that this would actually be pretty useful, but it's actually one of the more limited character abilities in the game, since it's not really required to be used at any specific point. Most obstacles can be cleared just by using Bucky's high jump or Blinky's hovering ability. Unfortunately, well, his weapon is just as limited. It's a spread fire, which you think would be pretty interesting considering that it follows the classic Contra pattern, but, well, once again, it's really very limited. It can only travel about half as far as one of Bucky's power pellets can, and when you fire it off, you discover that it's only about as powerful as one of Bucky's ordinary shots, so it's really not that useful. Jenny the Psychic Cat, on the other hand, is a far more useful combat character. She shoots mind lasers, and they are a lot more powerful than most of the other characters, but they shoot just quite slowly, so you have to use her in situations where you are sure you can hit the enemy. Her special ability is the Heat Seeking Mind Orb, which, once you charge it up, gives you complete control over the orb itself so that you can guide it straight to the target you want to hit. This can be pretty cool if you're using it in a situation where you're sure Jenny will be safe while you're controlling the orb, because while you have control of it, she is just standing there completely in the open. It is not an ideal ability for boss fights, let me tell you. Finally, you have Willie DeWitt, who is the analogous human character. Seriously, that's basically the only part that he plays in pretty much every interpretation of the show, is to just be an analog for the audience. He is, however, a little bit more useful in this game. His weapon is a very big laser gun. It is, in fact, the most powerful standard weapon in the entire game, making him ideal for taking down tougher enemies, if you can aim it properly. Much like Jenny's mind lasers, it can take a little while to recharge after each shot. His special character ability is to shoot an even bigger laser. Yes, that's basically all it does. You charge it up, you shoot it, and it does even more damage than his standard weapon. Great for bosses, I'll give him that. The special abilities of each character can be upgraded several times throughout the game, and even when you get a game over and continue, the character upgrades will stay with that character, so you don't have to worry about Bucky's high jump getting less high, or Deadeye's wall climbing ability suddenly running out sooner than it did before. However, life upgrades do reset when you continue from a game over. This is mostly due to the fact that every character shares the same health bar, so even though you can switch between them on the fly, if you're about to die with one character, you will die just as easily with the other. Death is actually a major motif in this game because the game wants you to die and die often. It is a concrete definition of what Nintendo hard really is. In fact, a majority of the bosses in this game have at least one move or one gimmick that will kill you instantly, regardless of how much life you have left. And once you start reaching the end game, the game will constantly cause you to die all the time. Now this would be a problem if the game was very stingy with checkpoints or how many continues you have, but the game is actually very generous, so overlooking the difficulty of later parts of the game and the fact that even the first boss has an attack that can kill you in a single hit, it's worth noting that it's your own fault if you decide to give up and just walk away. There really is no reason to stop when the game is actually encouraging you to get better and keep moving forward. If you die and get a game over, you start right in the room where you last got that game over, even if it's the boss room. Well, the game is also balanced out in difficulty by the fact that uh, it's also pretty short. It can be beaten in a couple of hours if you actually know what you're doing. 
In terms of artwork and music, the game is only sort of average, which is pretty disappointing because the gameplay is so good. I honestly can't tell you what any of the musical tracks sound like, except for the 8-bit remix of the theme song from the cartoon show, which is admittedly pretty awesome, and it's played over and over again throughout the game, during the cutscenes and the game over screen and the opening screen, and okay, maybe overexposure isn't really what we wanted out of the theme song. But other than that, all of the other tracks are just pretty forgettable. The art design is also pretty forgettable as well. The character sprites are just fine, having enough emotion and expression in them for me to at least call them cute, and the animations on them are also pretty well done too. But the actual backgrounds are pretty forgettable, bland, basic science fiction-y stuff. And it doesn't help that the first four stages you go through, the four planets, are each named after a color. So guess what the dominant color scheme on them is going to be? It actually feels really bland going to a place that is the blue planet and seeing pretty much nothing but blue for the entire stage. It's rather disconcerting. True, the game does get a bit more artistically interesting once you start working your way through the Toad Frigate near the end of the game, but even then, once again, it stays to the basic sci-fi designs, and it's not like you haven't seen things like that in games like Contra, Mega Man, Power Blade, or even Journey to Silius. So with all this being said, what do I think about the game? It's pretty friggin' good. The entire game is based on a license that came from a very underrated franchise in my opinion, and I really recommend that people check it out. True, the game is not perfect, and I really wouldn't say it stacks up with great licensed games like DuckTales or Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, but it does manage to come close. If anything, the only really big problem I have with it is that it didn't take advantage of all the opportunities it had. The multiple characters, while really cool, don't do a whole lot to affect the gameplay beyond, really, your own personal play preference. Except, of course, once you get to the end game and you're forced to use certain characters to get through specific obstacles. But before that, you can basically get through the entire game with Bucky and Blinky. The game is great and I highly recommend it for anybody who is looking for a true Nintendo hard experience. The game is tough, but fair. And who knows, by the end of it you might find yourself really latching on to the big green space bunny. Now get out there and croak some toads. Hey, thanks for listening to my review. Now if you don't mind, go and check out theovershield.com or go and subscribe to the Overshield YouTube channel. We would all really appreciate it and you'll get plenty of entertainment out of it. We got reviews, previews, interviews, and plenty of other views I haven't mentioned before, so be sure to check us out. Okay, thanks. Bye.